Hi, my name is Steve. <laughs> and hi, my name is Amy. I'm a person that sometimes plays video games and sometimes acts on TV shows and movies. That's a, a wonderfully humble introduction. Uh, <laughs> I have had the pleasure of knowing Amy for about a year now, and one of the most talented people I know for sure. Oh, yeah. I've just kind of embarrassed the heck out of her here. It's why I don't do introductions, because then people are like, oh, no. But I, I am super happy to have you here today. And part of what we want to do here, Amy, is we want to get to know you and who you are. So let's do as we always do, and let's start at the very, very beginning. Where were you okay. born? I was born in Torrance, California. Amazing. And how was it growing up in Torrance, California? It was great. I mean, I have no complaints. Torrance is a suburb outside of LA, um, but happens to be very diverse. Um, there's a huge Asian community also in Torrance and in the neighboring city in Gardena. So I always had people... Um, that looked like me, that shared the same culture as me around me, um, but, you know, was exposed to other people. And I never, you know, it was nice growing up in Torrance. I never felt like I was like a huge outsider in any way. So I think in that way, it was a huge blessing. And um, yeah. Did that end up being part of what made you into the person that we see today in that cultural sort of safety of, of having people around you that you could see how the world works? Yeah, I think so. I think there's a certain amount of confidence that I was able to have. A lot of people of Asian descent, they face a lot of racism, they get bullied in school and all this stuff. And I know that affects people um, way more than they think when they're older. I didn't have to go through that, which I feel really blessed about. I was around a lot of people that looked like me that were doing great things. You know, they were following their dreams and they were doing whatever they wanted with their lives. And I think that really helped shape who I am today and really gave me the confidence to really take what I want to do and run with it. That's great. Okay, so let's talk about parents. Who is your mom? My mom is Peggy Akuda. And what, let's learn a little bit about Peggy. Who, who is Peggy and what does she do? Peggy was born in San Francisco, California. And uh, when she was seven, she moved to Japan and then lived there until she was about a freshman in high school and then moved back to San Francisco. So she is a very multicultural, smart, bilingual, very caring, best mom ever. Aww. Yeah. I know she recently got the vaccine. Yeah, and that was that was a little bit of a trial and tribulation for you. I remember talking to you about that. It was she was a little bit sick from that. Did everything end up working out okay? Yeah, no, um, she was totally fine. The whole pandemic was quite uh, scary for all of us, yeah. obviously. But you know, she's diabetic. She lives with my two grandparents, who are ninety five and ninety years old. Um, so you know, we were all kind of literally living in like a glass oh. bubble. Um, just to keep everybody safe. We don't want to take any chances. So obviously when they got vaccinated, it was a huge weight off our shoulders I think that we got through it without them getting sick. For so. all of us, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So your grandparents, have they always been a heavy influence in your life? Yes, i am always been very close. My mom's the only child, so on that side, me and my sister are their only granddaughters. We were always very close. They've always, now they spend full time here because they're older. But when I was growing up, they were kind of six months here in the States and six months in Japan. But we would spend summers in Japan with them. And so, yeah, we spend a lot of time together. And, you know, they're the only reason why I still speak Japanese, which is a huge plus. I appreciate it now more than ever before. So it's nice that they were around so I can keep practicing my Japanese and stuff. Gotta keep it fresh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, your sister as well, like, uh, let's uh, talk about who she is. My sister, Lisa, now last name Ihara. Um, she is two and a half years older than me and is a mom of two. 
very talented artist and just all around a lot smarter and okay. funnier and wittier than me. Yeah, okay, I'll clip that and send and, it to her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, uh, she's just the better version of me, but uh, two and a half years ago. I don't know if they can get better than Maybe you. she has a head start. I don't okay. know. Maybe I'll get better. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how much she can get better than you, but uh, so... You know, what was it like growing up with uh, such a close sister? You know, how did how did that sort of start as your beginnings? Yeah, so we're two and a half years apart. We never fought or anything. We were always, you know, nice to each other, but we weren't like super, super close until my sister was in college, I think. When we got a little bit older, I think is more when we found that we could be friends mm. and not just sisters. So... Yeah, so ever since then, we've been super close. But, you know, like I said earlier, she was always really good in school, always got really good grades. The teachers loved her, all of the above, was in all the clubs and, you know, student body, blah, 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 blah. And I was not that way. <laughs> I mean, I got okay grades, but like, you know, I, I wasn't an exceptional student like my sister. So that was kind of annoying when I would like be in class and I would get a teacher that my sister had mm. a couple years before and they would be like, oh my God, you're Lisa's sister. I'm so excited to have you in class. And then like they slowly realized like I'm not like that much like my sister. <laughs> and then their interest in me like kind of declines over time. Um, but you know, it's, <laughs> I, I feel like my mom pushed us in such different ways. So like that was kind of, what she excelled at and what she wanted to be good at. And my mom kind of took that and ran with it and was really hard on her with school. And then she kind of saw that I was interested in other things. So she kind of switched gears for me. Like that's kind of what my mom's really good at. She kind of sees what, you know, you really want to do and she'll support that 1000 percent so that's amazing we all need people like that in our corners did was yeah, was sure. your mom like the the primary cheerleader in your group oh yeah 1000 yeah i mean my grandparents are also very supportive but you know it's it's hard with my grandparents because there's a language a little bit of a language barrier yeah. in terms of like the the jobs that i do right it's harder to explain to them about the industry and like what I'm upset about, or, you know, this happened today, or like, I didn't get this job. And it's hard to kind of like communicate that to them because they don't understand as much. But yeah, because my mom is really in the thick of it all. She literally knows like every single thing I audition <laughs> for, every single job that I do, literally everything. So yeah, she's number number one by far. She knows about this podcast. Oh no, mom, I swear. I'm yeah, being I know, nice. yeah. No, she literally, she literally knows I'm doing oh, this no. today, okay. so She knows my entire schedule. That's amazing. <laughs> when you know you have such great cheerleaders in your life when does the passion really start to ignite for you was it an, an early calling or was it a figure it out along the way kind of thing no it was it wasn't as early as like some people you know they're like i was putting on shows for my family when i was two years old <laughs> like i wasn't really i wasn't that way you know i i was the baby of the family so like i think i did get a little bit more attention and i was the one kind of like cracking jokes, blah, blah, blah. But I did not get the performance bug until I was in, I started dancing when I was in eighth grade, which was kind of late. Like I was like on a team with all these girls who's been dancing since they were like two years old. So I was like very behind. But from the time I was five years old to like seventh grade, I was a huge basketball player. I thought I was going to be in the WNBA. There's like school essays oh. that I did when I was in third and fifth grade where I was like, I'm going to be in the WNBA and all this stuff. And then really sad. There's like one sentence that I wrote, like, I wish I was a boy because then I'd be better at basketball. Aww. So there's like really like kind of sad things that you don't realize you were thinking when you were yeah. little and then you read it when you're older and you're like, God, society sucks. But yes, yeah, so there's a huge basketball player. And then, you know, I hit eighth grade and I was this tall and the girls I was playing against were like six feet tall already and I was getting injured a lot. So I stopped playing and then my chiropractor, who was actually helping me with an injury at the time, was like, you should go take a ballet <laughs> class because it'll it'll help you stretch and like, you know, your body will be healthier. And then I ended up really liking it and then I stuck with it. And then that kind of led me into the whole performance world. And then my dance teacher was a professional dancer that had like an agent and all that. And she was, 
you know, doing commercials and all this stuff. And then she introduced me to her agent. Okay. And then that's kind of how I started doing that. I was mostly like doing commercials, like as a little kid dancer, mm -hmm. you know, like when I was like in high school. And then when you're with an agency, they kind of just want to keep diversifying you. And like, you know, they're like, why don't you try acting and blah, blah, blah. So that's how I got into acting, ended up liking that better. And then here we are. Here we are, many successes later. Was it was it sort of uh, hard to transition over from, you know, to wanting to be a sports star to then going to be a ballerina, then going to be an actor? Was it sort of natural or was there some trepidation about whether you were going the right way? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was natural because, again, like I said, my mom has always pushed me to just go for it. If that's what I want to do, just go for it. So I never really thought twice about like, well, is this really what I want to do? Like, I was very sure, like I loved it and I wanted to keep doing it. I think the hardest part socially was really hard because all my basketball friends were like, what the F are you doing? It's such a different world. And I feel like people were kind of judging me, especially because like I said, I started dance a little late too. There were girls that have been dancing since they were like two, three years old. And then so I wasn't very good, <laughs> you know, let's, like, you know, I was an athlete for like my whole life. And it's such a different way to use your body that, you know, I was, I was really not flexible. Like I was stiff as a board, like everything was working against me. So that was hard. Just trying to play catch up, I guess, in dance, um, was hard. And then, yeah, socially, Socially, it was hard. It was just like a completely different group of girls and different type of people. Like athletes are very different than performers. Yeah. <laughs> and basketball was very diverse. I was on a team with a lot of, you know, black girls, Asian girls, Mexican girls, white girls. It was a pretty diverse group. Mm -hmm. Dance is, I mean, I was still in Torrance, so it's like, you know, pretty diverse, but it's, it's very white, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And especially in dance, I feel like your body and like the length of your body and the length of your legs and all that stuff kind of skews towards tall skinny white girls <laughs> okay. okay all right so i feel like you know that was kind of a shift too to kind of see like it's just a different world um so that was different but i don't think it was like a huge struggle per se it was just an adjustment i'd like to think that we all can sort of take a page from that and that you have to just kind of flow with it and that that's where your desire is and you know that's what is very curious for me is you know so you're you're in you know late grade school now you're pushing towards college you have already had all this experience under your belt you know where you're not a newbie you know jumping out into the world who has never done this before you know what was your perspective then on continuing into this you know eventual blossoming career you know your your motivation for keeping going? Yeah, so by the time I went to college, I knew I wanted to be an actor. I was kind of knowing that I probably wasn't going to dance as a profession anymore. But my mom begged me to go to college. I didn't want to go to college, but my mom was like, you have to go. That was the one thing that she kind of, you mm -hmm. know, really pushed me on. I'm so glad that I did. I went to USC and while I was in college, I'm also the type of person that I don't really like doing a ton of different things at once. Mm. So when I got into USC, I actually stopped acting for a while, like professionally. Mm -hmm. I was a film major at USC and I actually put a pause on all my like, you know, I dropped my agents and managers and I was like, I just want to be a college student. There's a whole experience to be had at school and in college. And I wanted to experience that and just do that full time rather than like, missing things because I had to work a job or like go to an audition and all that stuff. And by the time I was in college and I got into USC, I took school really seriously. Finals week, like I'm not going to be auditioning left and right because I have papers to write and I have exams <laughs> to study for. And like, I really wanted to focus on that. And I did really want to get good grades. I don't know what I was thinking at the time. I knew I wanted to act, but I also knew that I wanted this time to not act. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what happened during college. And then yeah, as soon as I graduated, I re-signed with the agent and manager that I had before, and then I just went from there. Was that the plan the whole time was to re-sign, or did something push you that way? No, I always knew I wanted to be an actor, and I knew that I was going to do that after school. So this was um, just the grand plan in action? 
Yeah, I guess so. And you know, what was really nice though, and maybe it wouldn't have been this way if it wasn't for the guild, mm -hmm. because I booked the guild when I was a senior in high school. I got to be on the guild throughout college the whole time. So even though I wasn't auditioning for new things and, you know, I wasn't professionally pursuing acting or whatever, I got to do this wonderful show with a group of wonderful people and people loved it. And, you know, we got to keep making it for years and years. And, you know, I felt like I was still acting because I was, right, you know, right. um, I didn't feel like I was really just sitting around in college, not doing acting at all. So it was, that was really, really nice. Um, and I don't know if it would have all worked out the way it did if it wasn't for the guild. Do you feel like, as a philosophy, things just work out? Or do you feel like that was where you were sort of meant to be? I kind of believe that things happen for a reason. Even bad things, I feel like there's always something to be learned. And it all. I, I think, yeah, like I think things happen for a reason. And like, I truly believe that I, I don't think I would be acting at all right now if it wasn't for the guild. Wow. And they're still my friends and they're my dearest, closest friends and personal life and professional life. Like it was such a big part of who I am. I wouldn't have met my husband if it wasn't for the guild. I think certain things just happened for a reason. And yeah, so I do, I do believe that. I think if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. You hadn't have stayed with the guild. What, what do you think you would be doing right now if not acting? I don't know. It's really hard. That's people ask me that a lot, but I don't really know because my life trajectory has been basketball, dance, then acting. Right. So I always knew, or I always thought I knew what I wanted to do with my life. And I never really had to like sit and think about, I don't know, other trajectories that seemed more traditional or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I always, when people ask me this question, I do always tell people that I admire nurses mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. They're a little bit undervalued, but when you're a patient in the hospital, I mean, my grandma obviously is 90 years old and she spent a lot of time in the hospital. She's had a lot of health issues and being a family member, like in the hospital, having a good nurse there when she's in the hospital really changes like your whole experience and your, you know, your mindset, how much hope you have, all that stuff. It really changes depending on, I think the nurse, because they spend the most time with you. The doctor comes in every other day and like says one thing and then like leaves, right? Or <laughs> yeah. like he performs a surgery, but you're, you don't have a ton of human connection yeah. with them most of the time. So, you know, if I were, if I wanted to do something that actually impacted people, <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think nurses are really wonderful, honestly. I think you would have made a great nurse. Human connection okay. is so important in every aspect of life. Yeah. Uh, has that yeah. really been part of what has been great with acting? Is, is it the, the people or the job? I guess because I played basketball for so long, I love being part of a group. Uh -huh. I love being part of a team, which is really what I love about like making TV mm -hmm. because it's such a big group of people, you know, you form your cast and then as the years go on, you get closer to the crew and you know, all these people, the, your makeup artists that you're there every single day and just the consistency of it. I really like when you're, you know, it's consistent if you have a job, but you know, like okay. I, I, I do love forming those bonds. And I think that's one of the reasons why I, I mean, there's so many other reasons I do like act, the actual act of acting too, but I do, I do like that kind of like group mentality. Do you have a routine that you like to stick to? Yeah. I mean, I love having, I like knowing what's going to happen, which is really bad for acting, <laughs> but you know, yeah, like we have, my husband and I, we have like a very strict morning routine. We have a very strict sleeping routine. <laughs> like we have a little doggy and she has a very strict routine. So it kind of keeps us really on schedule every day. And I do enjoy that. Yeah. I like having things planned out. You like knowing where and when things are going to happen and what, and of course life isn't always like that. So what have you learned along the way about how you help keep control? control of that well that is an ongoing struggle Stephen. Um, i always know i had a good question know. when the first name comes out all right Stephen. <laughs> my husband always tries to tell me you can control what you can control and you can't control what you can't control which is <laughs> like the most obvious stupid sentence but it's like i struggle with that a lot i try i i like to try to control and manage everything and I know I can't sometimes, 
But, you know, it kind of goes back to I try to always think what's meant to be is meant to be. So whatever I decide or whatever someone else decides for me, it's probably going to work out somehow. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, you're <laughs> but that's, yeah, you're right. I struggle with, I think I struggle with that the most is trying to deal with certain things that don't go the way I wanted it to, or didn't go the way I thought it would or planned for it to and stuff like that. I really struggle with that a lot. Yeah. We can only control our reactions to what happens. We can't control everything around us and controlling that reaction is, is a struggle for a lot of us. Have you found so far that, you know, the acting skill assists you with helping control your reactions? Are you able to sort of channel that actor energy? Or is it like, no, punch a wall? No, that does not help me at all. No. What does, you what know, does help you? So when things like that happen, the one I get very anxious, okay. obviously, right? That's all I could think about. And I can't really focus on other things. And I go down the spiral and it's not good. I mean, the one thing that does help, I try to meditate. Meditation helps me with my stress which isn't like, it doesn't stop the stress from happening, but it kind of keeps it a little bit better. I think yeah. when I, when I'm consistent with my meditations. Is and it spiritual or is it just focus? I think it's more focus. I think it just forces me to not think about the thing I'm spiraling about and really just empty my head and just if I need to think about something, I think about breathing for like a solid 10, 15 minutes. And that kind of calms me down. So the meditation isn't really spiritual. I, would, I wouldn't say I'm a super spiritual person. I'm a little bit spiritual. The meditation, I think, is mostly just forcing my body and mind to not think about the thing that I'm spiraling about. Do you find it's more helpful to meditate during the bad times or the good times? Or are they equal? Bad. I only, only do bad. it during the bad. Only bad times. <laughs> Otherwise, live in life. <laughs> yeah. Look, I think I should be meditating every day, no matter what. But I, I have to be honest with you. I only do it when I'm, like, not in a good place. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how the husband does when things are going bad. You're pulling out the yoga mat. He's like, okay, what's yeah. wrong, Amy? All right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So what do you what do you find during those moments where, where things are bad and the meditation is helping as much as it can, you know? Thinking back on your life when things, you know, you didn't get the part or, you know, something was going wrong. What is it that sort of helped you as a mental focus to keep going? Mm -hmm. You know, what I think helped me a lot, which I don't think, you know, people around me like super appreciate is talking about it. I think especially in the beginning or in times where I get very frustrated, like you said about like acting or like not getting a job or something, I would, my first instinct is to shove it in, like keep it in and not say anything because I'm a little bit embarrassed by it, right? Like there's a part of me that's like a little bit ashamed and embarrassed and I don't want my mom to know that I had a bad audition or I got it, I didn't get this part because, you know, especially the people close to you, you want them to be proud of yeah. you and all this stuff. So my first instinct is always to not say anything and pretend everything is okay. But I found that as soon as I talk about it, especially, you know, with people that are close to me, people that matter, mm -hmm. as soon as I talk about it, I let it out and I have a good cry, I feel better. I think it's just literally for me when i say it out loud and someone else knows it's not just mine anymore you know you kind of throw it into the universe and kind of empty it out of your body and that really does help me sharing a lot so i've been trying to be better about sharing negative things with the emotional people. load that makes total sense are you somebody who likes to ask lots of people for advice and then follows none of it or do you try to ask nobody for advice and then just Go off and do your own thing. <laughs> That's a really good question. I've been grappling with that this past weekend. I have a very small group of maybe three or four people that I like to truly get advice from. The council and, of Amy, okay. Yeah, and it's, it's very, I mean, it's literally just my mom, mm -hmm. my husband, mm -hmm. my sister. Mm -hmm. And then if it's about acting, it's usually my one of my good friends. And... That's really about it. Do I always take people's advice? No, I feel like sometimes I do do that dumb thing where I ask people hoping that they'll just tell me what I want to do. Do you know <laughs> what I mean? Tell me what I want to do, yes, yes. Yeah, 
I do that sometimes, but sometimes I think I don't know what I want. I think that's a huge thing I struggle with that I kind of realized recently is that, especially I think maybe it's a post COVID situation where like we all kind of our mind really shifted of like what's important and what's not, you know, when you're in a pandemic, it's been really hard for me to kind of know what I want. And I ask people for advice. It's not really hitting any chord with me, but I think it's because I don't have an opinion on it or I don't know what my opinion is on it. So that's been kind of hard. Yeah. Looking for that North star in your life, right? Yeah. Yeah. And you know, no one could give you that except yourself. Mm. Yeah. Right. And especially with my mom, I get frustrated with her because it's like, you should be the one that tells me what to do, <laughs> right? Like, you know me better than anybody and all this stuff. And she's like, I can't tell you, you know, she can't tell me everything. So that's been a little difficult. So what do you do? What do you do when you can't find that North Star? What, what is it, that little voice inside you? What, what do you do? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm literally struggling with it like today, yeah. but I try to, when I have a tough decision to make. I try to pick the one that I will regret less or, mm. or like I try to pick the one where if the worst case scenario in that situation happens, which one I would be okay with. Does that I make love sense? that. I love that. And for those of you listening, hit your rewind buttons because that was a real gem right there. Amy picks <laughs> the ones that she would regret the least. And I think that's something that really is a great message to put out there, especially for people who are looking for what to do and don't know what to do is sometimes you have two bad choices. Sometimes they're not good choices, yeah. no matter what you choose. And, and really looking at it, as you said, looking at it as which ones am I going to regret the least? That's brilliant. Yeah. I think regret is one of the worst feelings in the mm. world, you know, especially because you have to look backwards. Right. Yeah. And everyone always says, don't look backwards, don't look backwards. But if kind of forces you to look backwards, you literally cannot do anything about it. Whatever you're regretting, there's nothing you can do about it to change it, right? Mm. Except the way you think about it is the only thing. You cannot change what happened because it's in the past. Right. So I try to avoid regret. Unless you're a time I lord, then you can. But it's you're true. not a time lord. Sorry. So what keeps you up at three in the morning that, that you're regretting that, that you learned something from? Like, we all have those things where, like, I stole a cookie one time in third grade. You didn't learn anything from that. You still stole a cookie in fifth grade. But what is it, what is it that you've regretted that you have learned from? There are very tiny things that keep me up at night. And one of the stupidest things that keeps me up at night, or that used to keep me up at night, was when I used to audition a lot in person, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, I should have said that line <laughs> this way. Right instead of that way. Or like, I should have said this when I left instead of this. Like that would have made me look more charming or something that keeps me up at night or used to keep me up at night. But other than that, I don't know. I mean. It sounds like the control is still something that runs through that it's as a well. Lot. It's yeah, it's everything in my life that I try to control that I can't control, which is still, you know, I haven't figured that one out yet. To be honest with you, and my husband will tell you that too. Like I try to control everything. Great, we're interviewing him um, next. No, um, so. <laughs> <laughs> he's actually a good one. I feel like he knows what he's doing sometimes. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's something that's you know great to mention as well. Is you know you're not always going to have control. You're always going to have those self doubts, and you know that's obviously something as an actor. I'm sure you struggle with every scene where you replay it in your mind a hundred times how you could have done it better, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so you still struggle with that control. Has it taught you anything about that looking back experience, as you were saying, about letting it go and being like, well, it's done now? Nothing from inside my brain, but, you know, sometimes you'll have, like, this audition where you feel like you did terrible and you still get it. <laughs> <laughs> then you're like, oh, it's never as bad as you think in your mind. I do this a lot with like in social situations where like, I think I said something offensive or like, I think I upset somebody or like, I think this person was in a bad mood and was it me? Like, did I say something bad or, you know, I do that a lot. And that, that actually keeps me up at night. Huh. 
if I feel like my friend responded in a text in like a weird way or something and I'm like, oh my God, did I say something that like, ups like she didn't add an emoji, like something so stupid, <laughs> right? And I'll like be like scrolling through a text or like replaying conversations and like be like, oh my God, I could have said it this way instead of this way. Maybe she didn't like the way I talked about her dog. I don't know, like all this stuff, it turns out the next day she like is completely normal. And like, hmm. I was just in my head about it. In those like situations, I did realize I do realize now that like it's never as bad as you think it is. Do you know what I mean? Like no one's paying attention to you that much. <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Like, yes. <laughs> like, oh my god! Like, I he must have not liked the way I like looked at him when I said this thing or whatever. And it's like, no, that guy was like looking at his phone while you said that. Like he wasn't even listening to you. Like no one is paying attention to you that closely <laughs> there's there's a great line that i heard a long time ago which is if all of us knew how much the rest of us were not paying attention we wouldn't worry about what everyone else is thinking because they're so busy thinking about what you're thinking about yep 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 i think that's so true and i remember when i was little and my you know your mom has to like do your hair right because you can't do your own hair yet and I would make her redo it literally 17 times because like I was worried about like what other people would think or like, you know, if if it just had like one little bump, like, oh, they're gonna judge me and blah, blah. And I remember my mom used to always tell me, no one's looking at you, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and, like, and I think it's like, you know, I feel like there's probably a better way to say it, but like, it's so true. Yeah. It's, it's true, no one's looking at like the one bump on your ponytail mm -hmm. okay like no one cares no. it's hard to get over that when you're a kid and you know uh mm -hmm. even into adult it carries on yes. i i feel like for me one of the hardest things is always figuring out what is persona and what is you know the real you and and mm -hmm. you know as an actor you know and a twitch mm -hmm. personality and a video game personality where do you draw that line how do you know what is amy and what is screen amy yeah, this is such an interesting question. I think I, I don't want to say I fall prey into it. I don't know. I think personality, Amy, uh -huh. Amy in certain social circles. I know my husband called me out on this, actually. Oh, no. He's like, you're so smart. But in like this particular group, you kind of play the dumb one. Hmm. And I think that's true. I think I didn't realize it until he told me, but like, even Amy personality sometimes, like, you know, when I'm streaming or when I, you know, am in public situations, I think I just play up what I feel like some people have projected on mm. me. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? You know, for a long time on the Guild, I played like this huge, like sassy bitch. <laughs> and I feel like sometimes I play that up a little bit, mm. you know, like, especially when I'm, I think it really triggers it when I'm in a room with all the guildies. Mm. It kind of, everything kind of comes back up and, you know, I think I do play a certain role mm. in that group. Mm -hmm. And um, I think I play it up more than, than my real self. I don't know. I don't feel like I'm like that, like in real, real life. <laughs> 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 well, we're all definitely chameleons. We all can definitely meld into different groups, yeah. different different roles, as you said. We play in different mm -hmm. groups. You know, have you found that any of the the particularly, you know, the guild and and Twitch streaming? Have you found that any of this has seeped into who you are? Has has the glass shield, the fourth wall, been been broken for you a little bit, where some of the the roles you play sort of become who you are, or have you been able to sort of section that off? I think like every role you play definitely informs you in some way, yeah. right? Informs your true self in some way. Like it took 10 years, but now I love to play video games <laughs> and you know, that seeped into my true self. I really do like mm -hmm. it. And you know, when I got the role on Atypical on Netflix, um, I played a therapist for a young boy on the autism spectrum. And I think that informed me in so many ways. I think in such a positive way i was able to kind of see into a life that you know a disability that i didn't really know much about my character was a therapist and i don't know i think it gave me a lot of empathy like it really taught me how to empathize uh -huh. with 
people that that I was like more unfamiliar mm-hmm. with their life. Do you mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? And so those kinds of things definitely seep in and definitely changes how I think and who I am. And, you know, in this case, it was a very positive thing, which I'm really thankful for. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I try, you know, I think that's what we all struggle with, right? Is like, how to be your most authentic self. Mm-hmm. And sometimes you don't even know what the fuck that is. Like, <laughs> am I am I like the dumb bitchy girl? I don't I, I don't know. I mean, I don't think I am, but I don't know. It's it's hard to say. Like how like what is really who you are? It's just like Do you think it's more fluid who you are? Do you think it, it kind of changes and melts as you grow and you change? I definitely think that, yes. And I think not just with time and you, of course people grow and people mm-hmm, change mm-hmm. over time. I, I truly do believe that that can happen. But I also think that people can be multiple things at once. You know what I mean? Like as much as our society doesn't like putting people, you know, li- putting labels mm-hmm. on things, right? I feel like sometimes when we're so in search of our, like who our authentic self is, that almost puts you in a box also, mm-hmm, doesn't yeah. it? There can't be just one version of your most true authentic self. Like there has to be, I don't know. I think people can be multiple things. I don't know. It's, yeah, as, it's tough. It, it is tough. Has, has empathy pay, played a big role for you? You know, I, I, I do. I, I feel like I've always been one of those people that can read a room and people's vibes and people's moods like in an intense way. Or so I think. Mm. And people's moods and vibes kind of affect my mood and vibe. Mm. I heard someone talk about, I guess it's called an empath Mm -hmm. or something. I don't know how, there must be some sort of spectrum on that too. And I don't know how deep in it or how, you know, little I am of that. But I, when I was listening to a podcast about it, I was like, oh, that kind of sounds like how I, you know, like Mm. you really just take someone else's energy and it kind of like affects you. Mm -hmm. So I definitely feel that way. Sometimes when I'm around people, I kind of like take on their energy and I don't know. Yeah. I don't really like that that much to be honest (laughs) with you. I don't think anybody really likes being brought down. I mean, everybody's had experiences where your friend is in a bad mood and you want them to be happy and they're in a bad mood and you're like, darn it. No, I can't be in a good mood. But you know, the, being empathetic and being an empath are, are so different in that if you are an empath, really, you can walk into a room and you can almost feel that energy. And I'm mm-hmm. guessing that's been a, a great life skill for you as well. Has it, has it been something that you have tried to lean away from because you don't sort of want it? No, because it is a good life skill, Stephen. I, I feel like I used it to my advantage Ah. in certain situations, because that's where like the roles come in, right? Like I kind of can see what the other person wants from me. Mm, Does that make sense? Or like, I kind of can read what role I'm supposed to play with certain people and kind of not to be, that sounds so like psychotic (sighs) and like, I'm like a sociopath or something, but it's like not that drastic. Okay. It's just like, subtle changes right like it's not like i turn into a completely different person writing down notes right now all right he winked at me twice i saw that all right so in that way i think it's kind of helpful yeah and i you know and i like that you admitted you don't like being that way but it's a useful tool and you know yeah do you feel like there's a lot of those in your arsenal of how you get through life of these these tools that you're sort of having in your mental capacity to get through life yeah i'm a huge like i said earlier i'm a huge everything's fine everything's fine like my my initial i think defense mechanism is you know especially if something if i have a conflict with somebody Mm. my first reaction is like fuck that girl (laughs) like fuck that girl like you know what i mean like i don't need her like blah 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 but inside I'm hurting. I need that person in my life. I love that person. And that comes out much, much later when you have some time to think about it. But yeah, my initial reaction is always like, fuck that, (laughs) like, whatever. I don't care. You know, Um, that's a huge one for me. Have you had any luck controlling that and and bringing that more in mind? The, The openness, the vulnerability? Have you had any luck with being a little bit stronger in telling people that you care when they're hurting you? Not that I can think of. Okay, next question. (laughs) (laughs) That's a work in progress. I mean, I've been better about communicating that to other people. You know what I'm saying? Like, 
if say I had a conflict with my sister, no. I've been better about telling my husband, mm -hmm. this is how I'm feeling. You know what I mean? And you know, he'll like talk me through it and stuff like that. But it's still really hard for me to, I guess I also don't really like confrontation, mm. like with that specific person that I'm having the conflict with is, Pretty hard. Conflict avoidance is something that a lot of us deal with. Although to an outsider perspective, it sounds like if you're communicating better, you have learned to conquer that somewhat. Yeah, step one. Step right? one. That's right. You got you got to start somewhere, right? You got to start absolutely somewhere. You know, yeah. was there really a, a a time or an incident where you know you sort of felt like this mental attitude that you've got has really sort of helped you on your career to Twitch and post guild or medium guild. I'm not sure what you would call it right now, but you know, wh where did you really go? You know what? This is what Amy is. And you know what? I can handle this. No, of course. I mean, I think a ton of the reason why I can't get rid of this, like, I don't care attitude is because in acting 99.9% .9 of time, I'm hearing no, I'm hearing rejections. I'm hearing like, you're not good enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not ugly enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not fat mm. enough. You're not this enough. You're not Asian enough. You're not you know, <laughs> white enough, blah, 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 blah. And my way of coping with that is, no, nah, okay, fine. I don't care. Yeah. Like, fuck them, mm. right? If I don't know how else I would have survived this long, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest with you. Yeah, I think that's where it came from. And I think that's what has in a weird way, helped me not go crazy being yeah, an actor. Continual successes at, you know, not only web series and sites like Twitch and on Netflix. And, you know, you keep landing these successes. Are, is, is that what you feel qualifies as success? If I asked you point blank, what is success? Could you answer the question? <sighs> okay, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you the honest answer and then I'll give you the answer that I want okay, We'll just to put think, in okay? the fake answer. It's fine. It's M&M's. <laughs> The honest answer is success is for me in acting in particular, booking a lot of jobs, making some money. I don't really care about like the awards and whatnot, but I, I love being on shows that are respected. Mm -hmm. um, I like shows that people don't, for me, I don't see success as like being on a soap opera. Mm -hmm. You know, like I want to be on, on a, on a show of quality mm -hmm. and I want to be able to sustain myself being an actor financially. That's what I always thought success was for acting for me, was to be on shows that I loved and for me to be financially independent. Now, <laughs> I am trying to evolve into this mindset of success because before I heavily relied on success or the term, like feeling successful based on acting alone. Mm -hmm. Like if I was not being successful with my acting career, Amy, the human being is not a successful person, is and was my mindset. Now, I think this might've been a COVID situation where my mind shifted a little bit, but these days I want success to be based on Amy, the person, not Amy, the actor or streamer. If I'm healthy, if I have a good group of family and friends who I love and they keep me happy and we have fun, we make memories and I'm happy. Like if I'm happy with my life, I should feel successful. I guess I want more of my personal life to reflect how successful I feel and not just my career. I think success is so, so tied to everybody's jobs. And I think you can be a successful human being without having these crazy accolades or, you know, yeah. money from your job or whatever. And I would love to be able to embody that more. So what's your greatest non-professional success? Well, I think I'm a really good wife. Um, I have a loving partner and we have a great relationship and, you know, we're happy and all that stuff. And when I do things that make him happy, it really, you know what uh -huh. I mean? It's like kind of that act of service kind of thing makes me feel really good. I'm a little dog mom and, you know, keep, she's really old and whatever, but like, you know, just keeping her happy and healthy makes me feel good uh -huh. about, you know, 
we were also in a situation where we can help out my mom a lot financially and she gets to live like a nice retired life mm -hmm. and that makes me feel really good it's really just about i think i don't know just keeping me and my family and friends close by and happy and comfortable oh, yeah. makes me feel great. so are you saying it's that human connection right that you, yep. you, you, you've threaded that through this entire conversation. It's just human connections. And do you think, you know, looking back on interviews like this, and do you really feel like that is who Amy is, is someone who just wants people to be good and kind to each other? 1,000%. Yeah. I think we're nothing without human connection. And also going back to atypical, that was, you know, as actors, we like always have to kind of tie things into something that makes it personal for us. Yeah. And one of the big things when I was reading about autism and just, you know, random things in general, human connection is so, it's like the number one thing that all humans want. Mm -hmm. And for people with autism, that's hard because they don't connect to people in the same way as neurotypical people. And so, you know, basically like, not to get all like actory, but <laughs> like the whole entire like motivation for that character and the project was, you know, I wanted to help this Sam, who's the little boy with autism. He's not little, he's 18, <laughs> but tiny kid, you know, find ways to connect with people, get him that human connection that he so desires because that's really what he wants, you know? So yeah, I think, I don't know if it's the show that helped me figure that out. I don't know if it's COVID and being isolated for a year that helped me figure that out. But I think you are spot on in that. I don't think it's, I also don't think it's just me that like mm. needs human connection. You know what I mean? I think it's everybody, whether they realize it or not. You know, social isolation is a big problem. It's a pandemic. Yeah. Um, yep. A lot of us deal with, uh, especially guys out there, um, we tend to be a little bit more isolated. We tend to not do so well at keeping friendship groups. You know, it's uh, the, the statisticians tell us that if you are a middle-aged guy, you're more likely to be in trouble health-wise because of your mm -hmm. mental status, because we tend not to share with our friends. And I hope that's changing as society goes on. I hope guys are getting better at it, as I think guys, gals, and non-binary pals should all find someone they can share with, you know? Yep. Do, you, do you find that sharing that load that with the human connection, that's something that has ended up getting you here? Do you think that does contribute to that non-professional success? Yeah, because I feel like as long as I do, that need for human connection is fulfilled. I think in the most basic sense, I'm living a pretty successful human life. <laughs> I wouldn't disagree with that in the least. And my gosh, I feel like I literally could talk to you for a billion years and it's somehow been an hour. I don't even know how. Oh my God, I have. <laughs> That's crazy. I know. It, it's it's amazing that these... Uh, I mean, listening to you, I could honestly do it for six more hours. So I will oh my definitely have to uh, to bug you again down the road. But you're not done yet. At the end, okay. we have ten questions, and these are rapid fire. Oh, rapid fire. Rapid fire. Oh, no. That's right. So I'm going to ask the question, and you can take as long or as little to answer the question as you like. And uh, I'm not going to interject at all. They're your answers, your life. Let's learn ten things. Plus the big question about Amy Akuda. Ready? Mm -hmm. What's your favorite color? Purple. What's your least favorite color? Orange. What's the best thing you've ever tasted? A Kobe beef steak in Japan. Ooh. What's the worst? I hate shrimp. Ooh. Have you ever loved? Yes. Have you ever hurt someone? Yeah. What can somebody do to earn your trust? Just be honest, I guess. I hate people who lie. What is Obviously. Well, yeah, what is something that someone can do to lose your trust? Lie. <laughs> if you spoke to yourself when no one else is around, would you be friends with the person who spoke to you like that? Yeah. You know, I'm I I don't I don't I'm not that hard on myself. Yeah. Okay. If you died tomorrow, what do you hope that people remember you for? Mm, that I was caring. Oh. Okay. All right. Now, the big question. Amy Okuda, do you have oh a personal life philosophy that you would attribute 
to getting you right here where you are today. I don't know if this is considered a philosophy, but I 110% believe that what got me here today are my family and friends closest to me. Your closest circle of people to support you is very important. Do you believe that some things are better left unsaid? <laughs> I don't believe so, but I know a lot of people do believe that. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. Amy Akuda, thank you so much for being a part of this show. And uh, my, my hat's off to you. One of the most interesting people we've had on yet. Thank you so much. Oh, Stephen, thank you. Thanks for asking me.